Okay, hello there. My name is Luke Jennings. I'm VP of R&D at Push Security, and I'm here to talk to you about Snowflake and why it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so we're going to have a few practical takeaways to take from the Snowflake incident. So to begin, uh, as an agenda, we're going to go through the an overview of the Snowflake breach itself and sort of how it happened, what happened. But then we're going to kind of move on to why Snowflake is actually a watershed moment for identity attacks and look much more at the general problem space that's led to this and why Snowflake is just an example of probably what's going to be a lot more to come. Uh, we'll then also consider some Snowflake investigation response guidance. So if you've got uh, a Snowflake instance right now, we're going to look at what sort of steps you should be taking specifically with that and some of the common pitfalls that we've seen people fall into recently. And then we'll just have a summary of the key takeaways. So what the headlines say. So unless uh, you've been under a rock for the last few weeks, this has been such a big data breach that I'm sure you've all heard of it and seen the many, many headlines. Um, it's a huge data breach. So what we've had is, is Snowflake itself is a data warehousing solution and effectively it's a SQL database. So it contained large quantities of data and we've had multiple different customer instances of that compromised through, through compromised credentials. Uh, which means we've kind of got large amounts of data in each instance being exposed and it's hit many different customers, some of those being huge customers themselves like Santander and Ticketmaster, for example. So it's being billed as one of the biggest breaches in, in uh, history, maybe the largest data breach in history ever, potentially by the end, once we see everyone that's been compromised through it. So huge breach and it's happened through identity attacks. So, high level, just the facts, what actually happened? Well, it started with Snowflake users being infected with InfoStealer malware. And this, according to Mandiant, actually goes back as far as 2020. So we're looking at several years ago now. So that InfoStealer malware did what InfoStealer malware does. And it stole credentials and session tokens and all the other things that InfoStealers uh, Info Stealers do. And like... Uh, in many cases now, rather than the attackers using uh, those compromised credentials straight away and directly themselves, there is a larger, broader criminal ecosystem for this. And so they put those credentials up for sale so that other criminals could buy them to use them. So those were available on criminal marketplaces. And what we then had was hundreds of Snowflake credentials and company login page addresses, etc., circulating online available for sale. And what's happened with Snowflake specifically is that MFA is missing by default on Snowflake accounts. And that's not unique to Snowflake. That's actually very common in, in the SaaS world. But it did affect Snowflake. And at some point in recent history, attackers have decided to target Snowflake accounts at scale. They found that some of these credentials they stole in the past were still valid for Snowflake accounts. They found many of them were not protected by MFA. And then they've realized there was a large amount of data accessible in these accounts and they've used that to, to conduct a large scale data theft. So at least from Mandian, 80% of the victims identified were compromised using credentials stolen and exposed by info stealers. So that's the primary vector. There may have been other vectors as well, but that's the primary vector in this case. So I'm deviating away already, but the point, real point I want to make here that's, and be very clear about is that although it was Snowflake in this case, it could have been any app. Snowflake ticks all the boxes for the attacker, but don't focus too much on it. Okay, so like the credentials were available. So there was an opportunity presented by these historical data breaches. Um, Snowflake was susceptible to compromise because, you know, accounts reliably lacked MFA and actually contained valuable data. So in many cases, these passwords have not been changed in years. They didn't have MFA. It requires users to self-adopt that. So there was a susceptibility there, but again, not unique to Snowflake, uh, affects many different apps. And also it's in widespread use. So we've got a large number of companies using it, uh, either in-house or via third parties, and it contains all the data. So yes, it did tick those boxes, but it's not unique in that. Um, the question we should be asking ourselves more broadly as an industry is, how many other apps meet this criteria? And what's the next Snowflake? How many next Snowflakes are there going to be? So... Issues with the industry response. I've kind of alluded to this already. Um, 
I'd say maybe my issue with the industry response. I think the main thing I've seen people do here is ask themselves, do we use Snowflake? So it's initial panic moment, like either they already know they use it or they need to find out whether or not they use it in a larger organization. Uh, and then that has an answer, yeah, yes or no. If it's no, then sigh of relief, job done. If it's yes, it's like, oh, okay, well now we need to go and secure it. And then they're like, okay, we need to make sure if it's not already, we migrate everything onto SSO, enable MFA and so forth, then job done. Now in the very short term, it's an understandable response. It's to a specific incident, but this is a much broader problem. Uh, and it's really just the tip of the iceberg. If you look beneath the surface, there's a few key things here that make this a much more difficult problem that we need to solve at a much larger scale. Um, first of these is ghost logins. So even for apps that you know about and the identities you know about that you've enabled for SSO and MFA, there may very well be local logins that allow SSO and MFA to be bypassed. This is the case with Snowflake. If you enable SAML SSO, it doesn't automatically disable the previous single factor passwords. You have to explicitly go and disable those. We'll look at that in more detail later. And again, that's not unique to Snowflake. This general principle applies to lots of different apps out there. It can be local passwords. It can be recovery addresses, secondary emails, API keys, many different things. But I, ultimately, local logins can exist for uh, accounts that enable SSO to be bypassed. We've then got your shadow identities. So users self-adopt and create uh, identities at scale across lots of different applications. Many of these may be shadow apps you're not aware that are in use, and then by their very nature will not have SSO. Often they will, then won't have MFA because that's usually a self-adoption thing for users that's an opt-in rather than opt-out. So we've got all the shadow identities to consider too. And it's just not limited to Snowflake. Info stealers are not there to steal Snowflake credentials only. They steal all credentials they can see. They, they steal cookies as well to enable session token theft and hijacking. Um, so this is a really big, wider problem. Snowflake is just the tip of the iceberg. So I think the problem is we've seen people way over focus on Snowflake. Understandable in the very short term, but this is a big, big problem space that needs to be addressed by the whole of the industry. So what does the journey of a stolen credential look like? Um, so we get creds stolen via an info stealer. Uh, they're acquired by a tackle on a criminal marketplace. Okay, so we've got a range of credentials. They then may identify common, valid usernames and password combinations from that. And then they will want to spray those across known apps. So it could be that a credential has been stolen and associated directly with an app that it's used for, and that enables direct access to the most direct route. So let's say we stole a user's Google password, and then we log straight into their Google account. But maybe that's protected with MFA, or maybe they've since changed the password because the password was stolen years ago and they've changed it, it's no longer valid. But attackers can actually spray these across lots of known apps. So maybe they try it against a bunch of different apps and they find, okay, in some cases the password is invalid, so they've access denied. In other cases, maybe they find, oh, it's actually the valid password for that account and that app, but uh, there was MFA in place and we couldn't easily bypass that, so still access denied. And then we get to Snowflake and find the password works and there's no MFA access granted. That's what this looks like. That's what credential stuffing looks like in this space. One in three employees we see reuse passwords, which can include their core IDP credentials. So it's not unusual to see these credentials being spread and shared across different applications. So the question mark then becomes like, where else are these stolen credentials valid? You know, is, is the next Snowflake already in the same credential dump, even now waiting to happen? So like, what are the future targets What's the next ones that are going to be accessed? That's the, the question I think we all need to be asking ourselves. Okay, so I've kind of started moving into this idea of the big picture here about not just Snowflake. Um, but we'll ex explicitly talk about the big picture now and ask the question like, is identity security having its wanna cry moment? Uh, of which I think the answer is yes. I think this is very much a watershed moment that's really open people's eyes to a problem that's been there for a while. And this is a this is gonna be a turning point in the industry. So how do I, I like to look at this in terms of eras. And I think we're in a new era now. I don't think we're beginning. I think we're, we're living a new era yet. And people are only just waking up to that fact really. And that's the identities of the new perimeter now. That's the 2020s era. 
when we look back at this in the 2030s, that's what we're going to say about the 2020s. If we look back before, this is this is a regular cadence. Yeah, I got into the industry in the 2000s. Back then, network was the perimeter. It was the original perimeter. We were all compromising external services and finding web app vulns and trying to work our way through firewalls, um, port scanning to identify services, all that sort of thing. But then that got much harder because as an industry, we made secure network segmentation. We made hardened services. We did all this pen testing. We like locked down our firewalls and we made the perimeter really hard to breach and well contained for, with DMZs, even if a small breach did occur. And one day as attackers, we realized that endpoints became the new perimeter because we suddenly realized, hang on, there's these, these juicy endpoint targets sitting right on the internal network behind all the security controls. They've got loads of attack surface and there are users controlling them that can be social engineered as well. And we saw a rapid shift in attacks then. And I, you know, I was a red teamer at the time and suddenly we were just completely compromising huge banks and other big juicy targets. And it was too easy when it first started that, you know, the defensive industry was not ready for it, but we've been through a long era now of dealing with that. We've got the whole EDR market that's come out of that, the whole threat hunting industry. Um, we've got a huge number of controls that have been put in place. We've got increasingly hardened endpoints. They haven't gone away, but it's a lot harder now than it used to be. It's not, it's not the, the easy pickings. And on the other hand, we've had this sudden decentralized explosion of people moving away from on-prem and just having huge numbers of SaaS apps in use with huge number of cloud identities. And that's this, a new attack surface that's been created. So identities are the new perimeter now. And Snowflake is probably the one cry moment that's indicating that we've made this shift. So when I talk about identity attacks, what am I talking about? Um, there, you know, it's a complicated topic. There are many things that can factor into this, but I'm just going to consider a few basic ones at a high level here. And I think the key point really is that attackers, they don't hack in, they log in. Everything's focused on some kind of account takeover generally. And that could be old school phishing. It could be modern attacker in the middle and browser in the middle based phishing attacks. It could be modern credential stuffing, which is now a much worse problem because we've got so many more targets. Gone are the days of the single VPN endpoint, the single webmail endpoint. We've got all these different apps and all these different accounts. Um, we've got session token theft for you know getting around MFA controls by stealing a session. And we've got info stealers plugging into this that steal credentials and cookies that contain valid session tokens uh, from compromised endpoints where they are. They all lead to an attacker just logging in as a valid account or assuming a pre-existing session uh, and, and then conducting their actions there. So that's how it works. So really, identity vulnerabilities, they're a symptom of the problem. They're not the cause, though. Um, and for that, we need to consider uh, what the business sees or what they like to think they see versus what the reality is. And that is, I think, when we're talking to larger organizations, they want a single secure identity. They want uh, the, the few dozen apps they know they're using that have been officially procured through IT and centrally controlled. They want those to be behind a very secure SSO mechanism with good MFA controls, everything accessed via that one secure identity. And that's how they would like things to run in their business. And we'd all like things to run that way. The problem is it's just not true. It's, it's very difficult to achieve something like that. The reality, the harsh reality, is that we tend to have in any large organization hundreds of apps that have been self-adopted by different teams and different users over time. They then won't be essentially controlled by IT. They won't be behind them, uh, SSO. And there will be thousands of sprawled cloud identities that allow access to them that are separate to that. So this problem is much greater than what a business likes to see. The harsh reality is very different. Um, and that's what's happened here. We've got these you know, snowflake accounts that weren't going through uh, SSO that had single factor credentials. You know, and this is, this is just what uh, Snowflake's one example of this problem. And it's actually more complicated than even this. It's not just a case of, oh, there's the apps we know about that we've put behind SSO, and there's the apps we don't know about that we haven't put behind SSO, that we need to find out about so we can put them behind SSO. It's more complicated. There's layers of complexity. So I'm going to take an example here. Just consider one app, one app that you already know about and you've already put behind SSO, okay? But it isn't as simple as that. 
let's just use, I don't know, Dropbox, random example. Let's say we've got an official Dropbox tenant. We've put that behind SSO. What's to say there aren't other tenants of Dropbox? How do you know everyone's using the same tenant? Maybe at some point you become aware certain teams were using Dropbox and you adopted that official tenant and said, here's the official Dropbox tenant now. But maybe there's other teams and users instead of your organization that were already using other personal Dropbox accounts or other shadow tenants to share amongst the team that isn't subject to those controls. And even within the official tenants, there can be multiple login methods. Maybe you've enabled SAML-based SSO, but what's to say that it doesn't enable local password-based logins? What, what's to say it doesn't enable users to create API keys or add secondary emails as a recovery address or connect social accounts? Um, and for those other login methods, will it require MFA or not? Maybe not. Maybe if there are MFA methods there, it might be using types you would rather not use, like SMS-based, when maybe you're you prefer to use one-time passwords or pass keys. There are so many aspects here that even the idea of just knowing an app and having it behind SSO is not good enough. The situation is much more complicated than that. And that, this affects Snowflake in, in this instance. One example, this affects lots of apps. We'll see later how you can have Snowflake with SAML-based SSO and still have single factor credentials for the same accounts that are accessed via SSO. We'll see that later, but it's not unique. This affects many different apps. So it's a very complicated situation. So to recap, basically current security controls are failing to stop identity-based attacks. Snowflake is a glaring symptom of that, but it's not unique. Um, and what we tend to see, you know, is people say all of our apps find SSO, don't worry, we've got MFA and we've got full lug coverage. As we've seen from the previous slides, this is it's obviously a much more complicated situ situation than that. And it's not, and those statements are just not true. Um, so we may not know of all the apps, so they inherently won't be behind SSO if you've got shadow apps, but it's actually, there's more than that. It's even if you know of apps, not all apps support SSO. You know, we see fewer than one in three apps support SSO. Even if they do support it, they may put it in a much more expensive licensing enterprise tier that you weren't previously paying for and you're faced with, you know, five times in your cost if you want to add SSO, which is not a great business practice, but sadly it's, it's pretty common. Um, so in practice, we only see one in five apps in push data that are actually behind SSO. We've also seen like one in three people reuse creds. And then we've got the point we've made before at ghost logins. They can exist alongside SSO. So even if SSO is in place, you may still have ghost logins. Um, outside of SSO, Generally with MFA, you've then, you're relying on users self-adopting it at that point. Um, it's an opt-in, so it's generally less commonly used. So as a result, in, in general, in push data, we only see one in three identities are actually controlled with MFA. And in terms of log coverage, you know, um, we might have good log coverage from an identity provider that, that covers your SSO integrated apps. But at the downstream app level, few app vendors provide reliable security logs. And you need to go and get them as well. Um, when you've got hundreds of apps, that's difficult. Uh, and in terms of like modern identity attacks, they don't touch the endpoint, they touch the browser at most. So if you're thinking about your EDR, even your, your EDR is not really going to provide much visibility there. So none of these statements really hold up. Current security controls are failing to stop identity based attacks. So I've gone over the theory of the what and the why. Um, but in terms of evidence of attacks actually happening, you know, we're talking about Snowflake uh, today and it's a huge breach, but is that just one example? Um, are we just going to wake up to this and solve this problem? Um, no, I'd like to look at other stats here. Like identity attacks are now the number one threat. 80% of attacks involved identity and compromised credentials according to CrowdStrike recently. Uh, Microsoft has said they've seen a huge increase in token replay attacks. Uh, year over year, so we're seeing sort of session theft occurring there, you know, stolen identities. Uh, Verizon has said that like the number one vector in, in web app attacks, and we're also seeing like over a thousand credentials appearing online each day. They're generally online within a day of being stolen now. So there is a huge marketplace for this too. So identity attacks, they are now the number one threat. And actually we can see this, if we look at a timeline uh, that includes everything as well as Snowflake, 
we can clearly see that the frequency and impact is increasing now. So I kind of first started working on this problem late 2021, and you can see not much had happened at this point. So I was kind of theorizing of the future when I was doing research here. But then as time's gone on, when I've been working on this problem, we've seen a few public breaches that sit in this space occur, but they started out kind of small and not getting as much attention, but you can see how they clearly been picking up over this time. Um, and now particularly in the last, say, six to 12 months, it's really uh, picking up a lot now. We've had some real major breaches, even of identity providers themselves, like Okta and Microsoft six months ago. Um, you know, if they can't protect themselves against identity attacks, then what hope do the rest of us have? Uh, and then obviously this, it's all culminated now with the recent Snowflake breach and all the downstream organizations like Santander and Ticketmaster and all the others that have been affected by that. So this is, this is exploding now. This is the new era of cybersecurity and we're already in it. Okay, so coming back to Snowflake itself, in the short term, if you've identified you've got a Snowflake instance, you want to do something about it. How do you solve some of these problems, at least specifically with Snowflake? Um, and how do you avoid some of the common pitfalls when responding to Snowflake? Okay, so a lot of the stuff out there in the public domain has been around identifying evidence of compromise, the sort of threat hunting side. I'm going to link to that briefly after, but I just want to look quickly actually at the practical mitigations, more the sort of addressing the vulnerability. Um, and I think the two most important obvious things as practical mitigations is just going to be to either migrate to proper SAML based SSO and disable the local user password so you don't have ghost login still present. Or if you can't use SSO for whatever reason, you don't have a SAML setup or it's not going to work for you for whatever reason, then as an alternative, you can find the local accounts and configure them for external MFA. Snowflake allows this through Duo specifically, so you will have to use Duo, but um, obviously it's a good platform. Um, that's the sort of alternative. So you could do it that way. So it won't be via SSO, but you can at least MFA enable them. And, and otherwise you could just disable accounts that are not, not in use as well. But these are the two main things. We're gonna briefly look at how you might go about doing this. And there are some common pitfalls, so be careful. I'm gonna show these in a demo video now. Um, so first of all, I really wanna come back to this point about ghost login because it's so important. It's so easy to forget about. I just wanna show what it looks like to make it to make it clear. So I'm going to show how with Snowflake, uh, you can have two concurrent logins to the same account using SAML and using a local single factor password without MFA. This is not unique to Snowflake, but it does apply in this case, but lots of different apps suffer with this problem. So I'm just going to show it how, now. And so I've got some browser side by side here, just to show the idea of like the real user and the attacker. So on the left, we're, we're sort of emulating the real user and on the right, we're emulating the attacker who has stolen some credentials and wants to try them against your Snowflake instance. So the real user on the left is using a SAML enabled Snowflake instance. They log in as user Cody from their Okta instance and it does proper Okta based SAML and they're logged into their account nicely, exactly what we want. We're assuming for the sake of argument here that Okta has been obviously very well secured, um, has good authentication controls, tight MFA and everything. And we were, we were logged in as a user already and we just did SAML or auth to Snowflake. However, even though they can do this, the attacker on the right can still try the account locally, doesn't need to click the sign in with Okta button and that account still works. This is the default. If you've set up an account with a password already and then you go and add SSO afterwards, that happens. You have to explicitly disable that. And I'm pretty sure most people out there are gonna go and enable SAML and probably forget about this step. So it's really important. Okay, now we'll move on to a demo for actually harding in the accounts. So we're gonna look at disabling local account passwords and discovering accounts without MFA. So what we want to do depends on whether you want to go the SAML SSO route or whether you want to go the external MFA route. We're going to focus on the, on, on the situation of going the SAML SSO route. And we're going to look at what you would do in the console. So I've logged in as an admin user account now, and we're in the web UI ready to execute SQL. Now this is the first point to consider with Snowflake is that it's a SQL database. And basically because of that, everything is done via SQL. This may have actually contributed to why some of these vulnerabilities are here because there isn't 
there aren't like very easy, nice user control GUIs in it in the same way that you'd expect in a lot of other apps. It's very flexible doing everything with SQL. It's very powerful, but obviously you have to run commands to do things. So um, just bear that in mind. So everything's done by SQL. So I've now got this SQL statement that I've made where I query the, the users table in Snowflake. And what I'm looking for here is accounts that are that haven't been disabled, because if they're disabled, we don't really care about them. Um, we want to look at ones that have a password. So they have a local password and they also do not have external duo. So we're saying here, basically, if there are accounts with a local password that haven't had MFA set up, then we need to do something about it. Now, if, we're, if we've enabled SAML SSO, we just need to disable the local password. If we're going the external duo MFA route, then we would need to enable uh, duo MFA in those uh, cases for the account. So we're going to assume that we've enabled SAML SSO and we're just looking to disable the local passwords. But it's a very similar query we'll do for both. So first of all, first pitfall, we're going to try and execute this. I am, as you can see, I'm an org admin at the moment. That's my role. I run it and I go, okay, schema does not exist. I'm not authorized. That's weird. Now, at this point, maybe you start Googling around, why is this not working? How do I list users? Maybe you quite quickly find this command, show users, and then you run this. I go, oh, okay, cool. This works now. I've got what I need. Okay, I'm not filtering it the same way. But let's go and have a look along. And uh, I want to know f which users have local passwords. Oh, they're all false. Oh, great. Okay, so everything's worked. It must have auto disabled those passwords. Once I did the SAML based login, we're all good. Wrong. This data is is incorrect. This is a common pitfall. Um, the, reali the reality is that not all the information in this viewer is, an, is available based on the role I have at the moment as org admin. So that's actually incorrect data. It's completely misleading. Um, what I'm going to do now is switch to a role that does have permissions. I'm going to use account admin. I think security admin works as well. Um, and I'm going to run the command again. And you can see straight away how some of the columns, you've got the same rows, but some of the columns have more data than they did before. And that's because we've got full access to the data that's needed now. And now, if we scroll across, we're going to see, actually, every account has a password. They're all vulnerable. They've all got ghost logins. So be very careful with that, because it's an easy mistake to make. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to our, our filtered version uh, and we're going to run this again. You'll see how this actually works now because we've got full permissions to access them, this view. So we'll run that and we bring it out. And it actually brings out all the users. And that's because, as we saw, every account is vulnerable currently. They're all active. They all have a local password. None of them have got external MFA set up. So we're bringing out all the accounts as we expected. And what we want to do is, is address them one by one. So if you want to disable a local password, it's actually very simple. Uh, there are community articles for this, but it's just a simple auto command. So we're going to unset the password for Cody. And I'm just going to show now how this has addressed the vulnerability. So as soon as I've done that, if I go back to the login page again, and I, I put my KeePass password in, I try to sign in, doesn't work anymore. We've addressed the, the ghost login vulnerability. Okay. Now, if you wanted to validate those results, I'm going to show you another smaller pitfall, uh, but another important one to be aware of. We run this command again. Now, we would expect now Cody shouldn't appear because we've disabled this password. So has password should be false. It should, it should be taken out from that where clause. But it's come back and it's still saying has password true. Why? Now, the reason is this is actually a view and it doesn't update live. So it updates periodically. So eventually this will update and reflect the true data and Cody would disappear from this query. But if we're running it straight away, there's a period of time where it's going to be out of date. Uh, whereas if we go and run the show, show users command again and make sure we run it with the right privileges, account admins, so we're getting the correct data set. We go and have a look now. This one is live and we can see that has password is false. So it's just another quick pitfall to be aware of because you know, depending on what way you do it, you may have out of date data and, uh, you know, that could affect, um, the results. You just need to be careful. There's a couple of pitfalls there, but otherwise it's a pretty easy thing to do. You just need to do this on a per user basis. Obviously that doesn't scale very well with large numbers of users, but you could use more sophisticated, um, SQL to automate it across all users. If you'd like, uh, in the case of Snowflake, in many cases, then you may not have many users cause it's a database. 
Um, and it may be easy enough to do it manually, but that's that's up to you in your instance. But at the basic level, it's pretty easy to do. There's just some common pitfalls to be aware of. Okay. So I mentioned before that a lot of the, the talk in the public domain have been around threat hunting. Um, so there's some great work that's been done in this space. Uh, it's well worth checking out the Yeti Hunter tool if you've not seen this already, released by Pemiso Security. They, I think, combined many of the different indicators that they found themselves, but had also been released by some other companies. I believe it was Mandiant and Datadog were some examples. If, if I'm remembering correctly, apologies if I'm if I'm not. But um, this is something you can look for actual evidence of compromise. So one of the nice things about Snowflake is it does by default log SQL queries that have been executed. And due to the hard work of incident responders out there that have been investigating these breaches, they've found certain common queries and other things that have been used by the threat actors involved. And so this enables you to search for evidence of that happening. So this can find evidence of a breach, whereas what we looked at just previously was looking at really addressing the vulnerability to prevent a future breach. This will uh, give you an idea of if you have already been breached. So it's definitely worth checking out Yeti Hunter if you haven't already. Okay, so to summarize, uh, I said I'd have three take uh, key takeaways at the beginning. What are those three key takeaways? Um, I think first of all, we really need to think about the broader problem space here. So Snowflake is one example, but this is a big problem space for the whole industry. Your employees will create non-SSO logins. So you won't have everything via your nice SSO login mechanism. This is because of many reasons. It's because of self-adoption of apps. It's because some apps do not support SSO. It's because you might have multiple tenants of the same app where one of your tenants is nicely protected by behind SSO and you actually have another shadow tenant that you don't know about. Or it could be because of the second key takeaway, ghost logins. They can remain alongside SSO without MFA. So you can have multiple login methods that can exist per account. Even if MFA is enforced on SSO, local logins can exist without it. This is true for many apps. It's not unique to Snowflake. It does apply to Snowflake as we demonstrated earlier, but it's the case for many different apps out there. This, in, in the case of Snowflake, we showed it with a local account password, but there are many forms that this can take. It can be that you can connect social accounts separately to an account. So you could connect a, a Facebook account or a Google account or a Microsoft account or whatever, and that can sit separately outside of the normal SAML SSO login. It could be that you can set up a recovery email or even a secondary email address as a login. Users may do this. Or it could be simple things like creating an API key and then losing access to that API key. So you can access via an API without requiring actual normal authentication. This is a general problem that's very, uh, you know, has a great scale and affects lots of apps. That's the other real key takeaway here. And the third takeaway is just, is more of a reminder, infrastructures don't just target Snowflake creds. We've seen huge breaches of Snowflake in this instance, but infrastructures, they take everything. They take credentials for every app. They take cookies now as well to help bypass MFA by doing session token theft. Um, breached creds, even if they're found for app A, they may be valid for app B due to reused credentials and attackers are starting to figure this out now. So I think even with the credentials that have already been stolen out there, there's probably lots more accounts waiting to be compromised, let alone if we consider the more, you know, increasing info stealer infections in future that are going to steal more creds that haven't been stolen yet. So this is a very big general problem space to consider. The Snowflake breach is a symptom of a wider class of identity vulnerabilities affecting cloud apps. It's not unique. And attackers, they're already going to be looking for their next uh, app to target in this way. So really, you need to be prepared for when they do because it's going to happen again. This is the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. It's not the end of the story. So that's the real key takeaway. Okay, so that concludes the core part of my webinar. So just a little bit at the end for some further points and further research. Um, I spoke today mostly about ghost logins, a bit about credential stuffing, kind of briefly mentioned attack in the middle phishing. But if you're looking into the wider identity attack space, there's a lot more than that. Obviously, don't have time to talk about all that today. 
But the SAS Attacks Matrix is an open source project I released last year and I, I maintain it and keep it up to date. Um, it's inspired by the MITRE ATT&CK framework, uh, but it's really focused on identity and SAS enabled attacks, things that don't touch the endpoint. If you're interested in this space, you definitely should be based on the changes in the industry. Please do go to GitHub and check out this project and see if it can help you if you're on a blue team or if you're on a red team, whatever the flavor, it's a useful resource to go and check this out. And then finally, wouldn't be a webinar without quickly mentioning what we do at Push as well. So like, why am I even working on this problem space? I'm in research, I work on this problem space in the industry in general. The reason we do this uh, at Push Security is because we are stopping identity attacks. That's our mission. We're effectively EDR in the browser. The browser is where modern identities are created and accessed. Uh, so we're battling this with our product at the moment and developing it as time goes on. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about this. We have lots of different features, but I'll just show one quick example as it might relate to this problem. We will discover shadow apps. We'll, we will discover shadow identities. We'll discover weak passwords. We'll discover things reused between apps. So in this case, we would do that for things like Snowflake. I've just got a different example here of an account we've discovered in our demo um, tenant where we found that there's a single factor, uh, non-MFA enabled login method for an app. It's also using a password that's been found in a compromised password list, and we can see it's reused between a bunch of different apps um, that are listed there. So it's just a, an example of some of the features we have. So we use this to, to discover shadow apps and identities, uh, among many other features for battling identity attacks. Okay, so that summarizes the um, and finishes the webinar. So at this point now, we'll move on to any questions. Great, thanks very much, Luke. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a little bit of time to, to answer a couple of questions here. There's a few come in. Um, there's still time to ask questions. So if you do have any questions, please drop them in the chat and, uh, and, and we'll get back to them. Um, so the first question that I've got here is, you've mentioned that we need to be thinking about the next snowflake. What do you think the next snowflake will be? If you were an attacker, what would you be thinking right now? Okay. Um... I think realistically, probably soon. Uh, I think we're in a trend now where the attacks are increasing. So it's probably not going to be a great deal of time before we see the next breach of this type. I think the other aspect is that particularly given how significant this incident's turned out to be, um, Attackers adapt. So once they start seeing a new thing as being successful, more people start switching onto it. So I think a lot of people, you know, if I was an attacker right now, I'd be thinking, okay, maybe in the past, I had so many creds I was taking from so many places, I was focused on just the most familiar targets, like your Googles, your Microsofts, your AWSs, and that kind of thing. And I hadn't spiraled out maybe to other, to other apps, since found Snowflake had lots of data, I'd probably be saying, okay, hang on a minute. Maybe there's a whole bunch of other apps out there that I actually already have credentials for, that I'm just not familiar with the apps and I haven't really explored what's available. So if I was an attacker in that sense, I'd probably be going out and looking at creds I already own uh, and exploring more apps. The other thing would be from a credential stuffing perspective, I might start thinking, hang on, what credentials have I previously compromised for app A that might be that might work for app B, but I haven't automated the checking of that for app B yet. So I might be looking at, you know, Snowflake and other derivatives and, and, and automating password guessing activities for those to expand my own custom tool set so that each time I get a new set of credentials now, I can sweep them across a, a bigger range of apps to see where else valid accounts might, might um, fall out. So I think we'll see more of that. And for both of those things, there, there are probably lots of vulnerabilities waiting to be exploited, but credentials are already out there. So I, th I think this is a case of like, it's people just finding whether they're, they're, they're gonna work. And then obviously in future, we're gonna have more credentials stolen with more info stealers and so forth. And that's gonna open up other opportunities too. So it's a long answer, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the second question that we've got here is, in your opinion, would it be a good would it be a good idea to reach out to the SaaS platform to see if they offer the option to have independent user accounts even when SSO is enabled? 
for a large organization, what would be the best method to query this? Um, yeah, if you're not able to determine that easily through the interface, then yeah, I don't know, I, I guess reaching out to support or whatever your customer contact is, I guess, depending on how, you know, if you're a large organization, I'm sure you have a lot of clout uh, as a customer with a big contract to have a, um, you know, a customer success manager or something that you could, you could query that with. Uh, obviously, they're going to want to paint themselves in the nicest light. So you maybe need to take answers with a grain of salt with these things. Um, but I think, yeah, in terms of contacts, that's all I'd really suggest. Otherwise, I'd be trying to look into it myself through the, the platform, see it, you know, you can do a lot. It's normally quite simple features, even with your own account, being able to log in and seeing, is there somewhere I can configure an API key? Is there, you know, is there an area where it allows me to add another a secondary email address or connect a social account? So I just do a little bit of investigation for each of those as well. In your experience, then, just to build on that a little bit, um, is our local accounts usually um, can be disabled, or is that quite a rare feature? Um, it, yeah, it totally depends. I'd say it's probably more common that things stay open by default. Um, most of the time, when I have seen things with stricter security settings, it's normally like, if they exist, you've still got to go and enable them. And like say, oh, not just add SSO, but only allow SSO and disable these other methods or, or that kind of thing. So I would say, <laughs> I haven't done a statistical analysis, but just from the top of my head on things I'm familiar with, I'd say it's rarer for there to be stronger controls that enable you to do this. It's more common to see multiple auth authentication methods supported and not necessarily easily controlled. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here. Uh, why are credential attacks still so successful? I think, uh, obviously, you know, credential attacks are as old as, as time, really. But I think there's a couple of aspects. One, credential attacks involve users. And there are certain things, you know, typically we will say you can't patch the user. Users will pick weak passwords, users will share passwords, they would do whatever's easiest. So that aspect hasn't really gone away, it's still there. Um, and I think the other aspect is, is the change in the threat landscape here in that we've actually introduced new technology that's made this problem worse, which is why this has come back um, more significantly in that 10 to 15 years ago, we'd kind of centralized things where a lot of enterprises had a VPN endpoint and a webmail endpoint and maybe that was it. You know, so it was like one or two gateways to tightly control authentication, uh, have good controls, have good logging, visibility, all the rest of it. And now we've opened up, you know, hundreds of SaaS apps in use by organizations, many of which are self-adopted. So there's all these cloud identities everywhere. Um, so organizations don't generally have as, anywhere near as much visibility or control over that. Uh, and so we've, we've re you know, it, me it means credential attacks are just, there's just so much more attack surface now we've really kind of gone back um, in time a little on, on this issue. So they're just more successful to some extent than they, they were in the past. I think we'd, we'd got this a little better and now we've changed everything and it's got worse again. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, how does push manage to make the management of users, MFA, login methods, et cetera, easier when it's so complicated in apps like Snowflake, as you've just demonstrated? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we've, we've put it like a lot of focus into, into the browser because ultimately that's where identities are created and accessed generally. Um, and it gives us one sort of common standard way of observing logins. Uh, so it's not a case of where we need to have an integration with 1000 different SaaS apps that needs to be configured. Um, so yeah, we put our focus there and in that way we can just observe everything that the user is interacting with in the browser. So we can see exactly how they log into systems. We'll see, you know, SAML SSO logins have a well-defined request. We can observe that in the browser. So we'll see a SAML login. We'll see what tenant it goes to. So we can tell if there's more than one different sample provider in use. Uh, if it's a social login, we can see that and which type of social login it is. Is it Google, Microsoft, whatever. Um, and if there's it's standard username and password logins, we can see that and we can often see MFA methods used as well. 
so it just gives us a very sort of central point of visibility there. Um, and, and then we, you know, we can sort of map out the uh, cloud identity attack surface by doing that. Great. Thank you very much. Well, we're bang on 45 minutes there. So I think we'll wrap up there. So just to say thank you very much for everybody who's attended. Thank you, Luke, for, for presenting. And um, yeah, if we didn't manage to answer your question, please drop us a message on, on social media um, over your email and we'll get back to you. Um, and yeah, you'll receive a, a copy of, of this recording as well in your inbox to, to watch back later. So thanks very much, everyone. Um, cheers. Bye.